So this message is about the 40 days. <clears throat> and the number 40 appears 146 times in the Bible. God has used the number 40 to emphasize times of trouble or hardship. And he's also used 40 to emphasize a spiritual truth, to make a point. In Genesis, we read about God being displeased about how people were abusing the land and abusing each other. Noah was directed to build an ark and take his family on the ark with a pair of each animal of the earth. The rains came for 40 days and 40 nights, and it brought a great flood which wiped out every living thing that wasn't on the ark. In Exodus, we learn about Moses going up to Mount Sinai and staying there in God's presence for 40 days and nights. And when he came down from the mountain, he brought the Ten Commandments. In Samuel, 1 Samuel, we learn about how Goliath taunted Saul's army for 40 days before young David arrived to slay him with a stone. And after Jesus was baptized by John and by the Holy Spirit, he went into the wilderness and he fasted. And while he was there, the devil tempted him three different ways. Jesus wandered in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. So you see how God has used this period of time, 40 days and nights, and other examples that I haven't talked about here. And he uses them to emphasize something that he wants us to know and to learn. And when you see the number 40, pay attention, because it usually means that God is about to do something significant in the world. Christ was tempted for 40 days at the beginning of his ministry. And he appeared to the disciples for 40 days at the end of his earthly ministry. And today's message is about those 40 days that Jesus spent on earth between his resurrection and the ascension, when Jesus ascended to heaven to be there until he comes again. For the longest time, I really didn't understand about the 40, day, the 40 days that Jesus was here after he was resurrected. There's not a lot talked about. When Jesus rose from the dead, he conquered sin and death. Mary Magdalene and another Mary were the first to see the empty tomb. And they saw an angel who told them to go and tell the disciples that Jesus had risen. And as they were on their way to tell them, they saw the risen Savior. They fell at his feet, and he told them to go and tell his followers to go on to Galilee, that he would see them there. So the disciples went to the Galilee the Sea of Galilee, and they saw Jesus and they worshiped him. And in Matthew 28, it Jesus said to them, all power in heaven and on earth is given to me. So go and make followers of all the people in the world. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I have taught you, and I will be with you even to the ends of this age. Jesus' resurrection proved that what he was taught, what he taught was real and was correct. I imagine that if I were one of the disciples or even just a person who knew Jesus and the things that he said and did, I imagine that realizing that he had risen from the dead and actually walked again on this earth, that everything that I would have heard during his three years of ministry would have taken on a new meaning my eyes might have been opened, and I might have looked at things a little differently. That something so absolutely impossible, being alive after being crucified and died, a miracle beyond belief, that that could be attributed only to God and to his son, the living Messiah. I guess I might look at everything through new lenses, through the glasses of God's possibilities. Can you even imagine if our loved ones could return for just one day or one hour? If we could see them, touch them, talk with them, what would we say? Just think about that for a minute. To be able to hold their hand, touch their face, speak all those words that we hold close, would it, would it be even harder to let them leave again? 
Or would that encounter give us the assurance that one day we would be together again? It might give us more hope. For 40 days, Jesus showed his disciples and the world that he was truly alive. He was seen by multitudes in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. Jesus demonstrated to his followers that he was alive by convincing proofs and infallible ways. And he taught them again some of those things that he had taught them during his earthly ministry. One of the proofs that Jesus gave was that he rose and was was from the dead, was that he appeared. The Greek word for appeared is ophthalmalia, which means the eye or the eyeball. Luke is telling us in his scripture that the disciples eyeballed Jesus. They saw him. They looked him over in great detail. They examined his wounds, and they realized that this was the same Jesus they had known and loved. The second proof was that he spoke to them. He talked about the kingdom of God, and he prepared them for his departure. He repeated some of those teachings that he had previously taught. And the third proof was that he ate with them. In John 21, it tells about Jesus standing on the shore of the Sea of Galilee while several of his disciples were fishing. Do you remember in, I think it was Matthew, when Jesus was gathering his disciples? Some of them were fishing and he called to them and he said, put your nets on the other side. And they gathered more fish. Well, this time they did not recognize him as Jesus. And he called out to them, asking him if they'd fit, caught any fish. And they responded, no. So he told them to throw their nets over on the other side of the boat. And they did. They caught so many fish, they could barely haul them in the boat. And when they got to shore, they found the fire prepared to cook their fish. Jesus said to come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him if he was Jesus but they knew it was him. Jesus gave them bread and fish, and he ate with them. This was the third definitive way that he proved that he was alive. When I traveled to Israel, we went to the spot along the Sea of Galilee, where it is said that Jesus cooked for his disciples. My friends and I commented on how awesome it would have been to have Jesus set a fire and grill fish for us. And we're going to show some pictures right now, I think. This is the church that is built um, right at that spot, and it's called the Church of the Primacy of the St. Peter. And I'll show you the next picture, and then I'll tell you about that church. And this was the inside of that church, and they were preparing for a service. And then this is the spot on the Sea of Galilee where they, it is said that, they, um, that Jesus prepared a meal for the, for the disciples. The, the church, the primacy of St. Peter, remember that, that Jesus, as he was being taken to his crucifixion, Peter denied Jesus and denied knowing him three times. I can imagine the remorse that Peter felt when he denied Jesus, even though Jesus had predicted that he would do that. And so this church commemorates the time and marks the spot that Jesus reinstated Peter and gave him the assurance that it was okay. But how cool it would have been to have, have been um, served by Jesus after his death. How supernaturally perfect. Jesus taught his disciples about the, the kingdom of God as he had taught them during his three years of ministry. Jesus stayed on the earth to prepare his disciples for the task of telling the world about Christ. In John 21, it tells us, Jesus also did many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. And those are from John 21. This 40-day period is one of the most significant periods in our Christian calendar but it is possibly the most neglected, the least talked about. During these 40 days, Jesus walked and talked 
in places where his ministry had taken him. Jesus, his restored body, was seen by thousands. He healed many, and he continued to preach. Jesus reminded the disciples that when he was with them, he told them that everything written down must happen. Everything in the law of Moses, the books of the prophets, and the Psalms. And then Jesus opened their minds so that they could understand the scripture. Before he left them, Jesus gave them the great commandment of his being witnesses, his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In Luke 24, it is said, it is written that Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that change of hearts and lives and the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all the nations, starting in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I will send you what my Father has promised, but you must stay in Jerusalem until you have received that power from heaven. Jesus was talking about the power of the Holy Spirit that would come upon them 10 days later on Pentecost. Jesus then led his followers as far as Bethany, and he raised his hands and he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he ascended to heaven and he was taken up to God. The Holy Spirit that he promised the disciples is the same Holy Spirit that walks with us right here every day. The Holy Spirit guides us. It comforts us when we're hurting. It guides our steps when we're trying to make decisions. The Holy Spirit is always with us. We need to listen to the nudging of the Holy Spirit. This, the ascension of Jesus, was very significant. His miracles had shown Jesus' power. His preaching had taught wisdom. His persecution and his death on the cross had fulfilled prophecies. His resurrection, that he had conquered death, was an astonishing miracle. But his ascension to heaven, his physical body rising to be with the Father, that was witnessed by the disciples, this, the ascension of Jesus, confirms the divinity of Jesus Christ. In the big scheme of life, we discover that God is the only thing that really matters. Everything else is just stuff, just details. Our careers, our education, our possessions, our friendships, our dreams, our loved ones. In reality, it's just stuff. It's just the details. The only thing that really matters is God. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for your word and thank you for your love, for the Holy Spirit that you sent to be with us always, for the hope that you give us that one day we will be together with you. Amen. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me all along my my pilgrim's journey. Oh Lord, I want Jesus to walk with me in my trials. 
In my trials, Lord, walk with me. When my heart is almost breaking, oh Lord, I want Jesus to walk with me. When I'm troubled, Lord, walk with me. When I'm troubled, Lord, walk with me. When my head is bowed in sorrow, oh Lord, I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me. Well, along my, my pilgrim's journey, Oh, Lord, I want Jesus to walk with me, to walk with me, to walk with me. Okay, now if you will stand, if you're able, for our hymn of response. He lives. Remember, we have a council meeting right after services, and um, listen for the benediction. May the God of love and the love of God, the God of peace and the peace of God, and the God of grace and the grace of God be with each one of us as we continue to grow into the likeness of Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.